ask not myself, ask some other people like um, Nassim Circus or Enrico Roboti, who are the guys who are dealing a lot with revision. They have many patients who had a preservation, rhinoplasty, they need now rib grafts. And that was originally the idea, also from Roland Daniel, that we can avoid all these things. This is not true. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Rhinoplasty Podcast with me, Dr. Cameron McIntosh. So we're in season three, which means we are traveling around the world having in-person live interviews. And it's an absolute pleasure for me to speak with Professor Wolfgang Lubisch again. And we are in Brussels at the European Rhinoplasty Course. Prof, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah, it's a pleasure for me to talk with you all the time. And I'm so sorry that in last year, end of last year, I missed to come to South Africa because of the disease problems. But uh, I hope we can repeat it or we can do it finally. No, it would be great. Eh? <laughs> Prof, you know, since I last saw you, you've gone into retirement. And I am looking at you thinking you are looking so fit and healthy. Yeah, because I I tortured my body for 46 years during operations and now I have time to care about him. And I do a lot of exercise and I think it it is quite good. Even my son realized, well, father, your positioning st uh, changed. <laughs> but even though you might not be operating as much as before, you have started traveling so much and still doing live operations around yeah. the world. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, I like it. And uh, in the beginning, I thought if I'm not doing continuously uh, operations, I should stay away. And uh, when I started again in, in India during a course, it was th since there was no difference to the old days. If you stop for six months or if you stop for one day, it doesn't matter if you are doing such on working on such a sub subject for 46 years. Yeah. Prof, so we've been here in Brussels now for two days. We had the cadaver dissections yesterday and we've been doing a lot of um, lecturing and videos today. It's interesting for me to see what a wide variety of technical skills there are at a conference like this because there's some really experienced colleagues, but there's some people who are just kind of starting out. But at the moment, this world of rhinoplasty seems almost daunting to start because there's been this wave of preservation that's come through. There's kind of also like a resurgence of endonasal stuff. It's just, it's a little bit of a confusing rhinoplasty world at the moment. I understand totally. And I agree with that. And I think we should look back to the history. Uh, it was in 18... 87 or something like that, that uh, Rowe published the first reduction rhinoplasty by a closed approach. Around at the same time, that was our godfather uh, from Germany who also published this independent from him. And uh, almost one year later, that means in 1890-something, uh, uh, the first uh, preservation technique was also published, but only the classical reduction rhinoplasty and later on the structural rhinoplasty, which is based on that, became quite popular. Yes. Why? I think the reason for is that the structural rhinoplasty you can apply in each and every nose. And you can use it also for reconstruction after a failed rhinoplasty. This is not true in a preservation technique. I am not against preservation. I am doing preservation. But in contrast to the promoters, I don't think there is a huge amount of patients who really benefit from that. And I hate the hype and the marketing around the preservation. This is the problem, not the technique itself, but the hype around, because there are said so many, there are made so many statements which are totally wrong. Yeah. This is not an easy technique, not at all. You need a lot of experience. It said it is fast. It is really not fast. It is not faster than the other one. Then it said you can apply almost in each and every nose. This is nonsense. Yeah. And the fourth thing is um, that it is said there are almost no complications. Ask, not myself, ask some other people like um, 
Nassim Circus or Enrico Roboti, who are the guys who are dealing a lot with revision. They have many patients who had a preservation rhinoplasty. They need now rib grafts. And that was originally the idea also from Roland Daniel that we can avoid all these things. This is not true. Yeah. And we have to come back to a realistic perspective on that problem. And uh, there are also some uh, promoters in uh, preservation rhinoplasty who accept this full. But there are others who say, who advertise, they do 80%, 90%. This is not true. And I think uh, if some colleagues say, who is not doing that, he is too silly, too old to change and things like that, this is quite arrogant. Yes. And I, I think it has to come back from the hype to a normal status that it is one under other techniques, but this is indicated as a good indication is given only in a few percentage. I think in, in somebody who has a normal practice, maybe 10 to 20%. Yeah. Prof, the other thing that I find fascinating is that you one of the few people in the world who train both in ENT and plastic surgery. And I think what that set you up is in terms of your vast experience with the sector, because I feel that good septal work is often lacking in rhinoplasty. What, what, are you, what are your thoughts around? Yeah, this is totally true. And I think uh, septoplasty in ENT, when I was trained in ENT, it was thought it's a beginner's operation. And this is not true. Everybody was allowed to start with septoplasty, but septoplasty in these days means a Kilian procedure or to resect something and the deformed part have been left. Because they knew if I remove these two, then we will get a deformity of the external nose. And of course, the plastic surgeon, they didn't care about the septum at all. So this, therefore, I think there is a big lack, lack in knowledge too. And I personally always stated since decades, if who is not, who is not able to correct the septum properly, and septum deformity means not just to remove a small spur, it means a totally twisted septum. How to handle this? And the septum has not only a functional uh, effect, it has also a great aesthetic effect mm. because all deviated noses and how many noses are really deviated all depend on the septum. And you must be sure that you are able to straighten the septum and to take out the tension. This is the problem of the high rate of recurrence that the people don't are not able to take out the tension and therefore after a while it comes back. Absolutely. You, you mentioned in your talk this morning that between 30 and 40 percent yeah. of the crooked noses actually end up not still being crooked yeah. and that just comes down to the septum not being yeah. adequate. That is, that is exactly depends on the septum. If you are not able to straighten the septum you cannot correct a deviated nose because in 95 percent it depends on the septum. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about further training. Now, obviously the, the Stuttgart course is now being there for 30 years, which is, it's incredible. But my understanding also, and I'm a member of RAC, of the Rhinoplasty Society of Europe, they're also really strong on wanting to train people. So quite a few of the listeners around the world, how can they improve their technical abilities and skills through the Stuttgart course to RAC? Maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I think the Stuttgart course, which I founded 30 years back, was always based on life surgery. And this is, therefore, it was so fascinating for all the attendants because they say, saw life surgery. And I, create, I started a school. The Stuttgart school is one school of others who work too. And in the beginning, I had invited also guests from other uh, uh, other countries because I thought it's necessary but by time I saw it is confusing because quite often there was a contrast what they are telling and how they were operating and therefore I thought it's better to do it only by ourselves and we did it till now when I retired then I stopped also to do life surgery I am moderating and moderation is also important in, in this life surgery to, to bring the, the finger in the wound yeah, yeah. And yeah. this you can do in a situation like me, I can do that. Therefore, it is a benefit for that. But I see all the other courses around the world, many of them at least stopped to do life surgery. And there are different reasons. Nowadays, it's not possible 
do you get not the license uh, that a foreign doctor is allowed to operate. Yes. So in the EU, it's almost not possible. Even in India, where I'm often working, it is always a problem that yeah. the the hosts get the license for me to operate there. Yes. Yeah. And therefore, it is also demotivating if a famous surgeon needs a lot of paper to send somewhere to an administration uh, that he is allowed to operate. He wants to bring them something, and if they have a lot of problems, then he will not do it. Yeah. So therefore, I think it is... I think in South Africa it's not so difficult, uh, but it, for in, in whole Europe it's almost not possible. In America it's not possible. Also in other states it's extremely difficult to get the uh, license from the administration, uh, from the official administration, the, the medical um, institutions that you can operate. Yeah, I know. Last year, Shane, when you at the last minute couldn't come, Poor Sam Most had to have his first ever live surgery. <laughs> he had five cases in two days. Yeah. Prof, tell me about RSE's training. Is there an opportunity for people to do fellowships and things like that? I think RSE, I found it now 11 years back. And in the beginning, we had a tough time. But nowadays, we are very proud because we are the largest society focused exclusively on rhinoplasty in the world. We have now actually 800 members. And we decided because from the member fee, have, we have also some money and we don't, we want to spend this in education. And therefore we give five scholarships a year and the people get a lot of money for that. And they have, of course, access to the most famous institutes who are doing rhinoplasty in Europe. So this is a, a great motivation to become a member. And, uh, I knew from I know from this year we had almost forty applications applications for these fellowships. We spent five per year now in the moment, and we spent also fellowships for uh, research. People who have a research project can also get a scholarship. So we are doing a lot for that. And in addition to become a member, you have a huge video library. I myself gave a lot of my videos to them. So if you are a member, then you can see the technique in detail as often as you want. And this, I think, you can learn uh, rhinoplasty nowadays only from videos or from live surgery. Yeah. Otherwise, it's not possible to go through a book. We are people, at least myself, and I think most of my colleagues, who are fixed with the eyes, fixed on the eyes. Yes. They, we don't read so much, only when we want to go into the depth of a yeah. problem. And therefore, it's the fastest way to learn something with very uh, didactical, good-made videos. Yes. Prof, it's amazing to me to have a look at, at like how your career has changed, where in many ways, you, you could operate on one patient, maybe 200 cases a year. But now, where you've kind of moved in towards like global education, you, that instead of making 200 people happy with their noses you're doing it for thousands of surgeons yeah they're right right i mean you probably wouldn't have thought that no of course we had no idea that they and that is a very fast evolution in yeah. the, in that way and uh, i think uh, we have to motivate the colleagues that they take the chance yeah. because there was no when i was young we had not the chance then we had to apply somewhere can we come for a week to to stand behind you some accepted, some others didn't. They always were operating with the high shoulder so that you can't see anything. Uh, so that has been the uh, this has been the situation in in when I started my career. I operated my first nose in 1976. This is long time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So and and therefore now with the new media and the new techniques, you have so many options to do that, and you should take it. So, Prof, I know you're on your way to Paris now. One last question, and, and it might take a little bit longer, but in a way, like I've been doing this now for 10 years, but there's a lot of stress involved with rhinoplasty and stress that is, affects us with unhappy patients. Um, how do you deal with that time of your life where you might do 200 operations of which 199 have turned out great and the patients are happy? But there's that one patient who makes your life an absolute misery. And you think to yourself, why am I even pursuing rhinoplasty and trying to be excellent to what I'm doing? 
because it's a reality. I think we don't speak about it often, but I know sometimes I I, I just I can't even sleep at night because of the stress of what the going. patients are making on you. And of course, the problem is either, of course, I have th these patients, they announced once to kill me by a, that was uh, made in the uh, social media by a man I have not operated. And he said, we have to kill him because I did not operate on him. I refused to do that. And there are others who are a lot of uh, very, they are very offending and so And of course, it's it's a difficult situation, but usually why? I think we are not careful enough in selection. We know all the BDD problems, but then a patient says, now I'm seven, I have been seven operations and now only you can solve the problem. Of course, we know this is a very, red, it's a red flag already, such a saying. But in the end, we say, well, I think I can help him. This is not such a big thing. And then you fall in the problem. I have several patients where I am very angry on myself, not on the patient, yes. that I accepted to yeah. operate him because they, I knew about the red flag, but I thought yeah. it's not such a big problem. I can solve it. And I was quite sure. And I quite often in many of these patients, I get also at least a reasonable result. Not all results are perfect, but it was not no disaster. But the patient, they are following you and they pressing on you and then if it comes to the court and uh, it's it's a horrible situation but I think everybody who is in a little exposed position um, has these problems is and in it's in the United States uh, the problem the sums uh, they are fighting for are much higher than in ours but uh, also I quite often I cannot understand why the court accepts the sentence, why he accepts that somebody is ex accusing me, because it's so obvious that there is no reason behind yes. it, but they do it. Well. Yeah, and this makes your life, then I have, let's say, in my whole career, let's say two hands, ten patients around, which made my life so miserable. Yes. But as you say, one patient, it cannot balance by 50 happy patients. Yes, exactly. Can't. Well, Prof, thanks. Eh? Thank you so much for being on the podcast again. And um, on behalf of everyone around the world, thank you. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And I hope we can have a long uh, contact together so that I come to South Africa again. And I am sure next year in Belgium, we will meet again. Fantastic. So guys, make sure you come back again next week for another episode of the Rhinoplasty podcast.